a very warm welcome to all of you on behalf of Azim Premji University. We are delighted to be presenting today's program in our series of public lectures. This is perhaps the 80th or so, uh, and we started this about 10 years ago. Um, I know all of you have come here because you are invested in the development of the country and because you are well-wishers of the Azim Premji University. Thank you very much. Public lectures are one of the ways by which the Azim Premji Foundation tries to foster its vision um, of a just, equitable, humane and sustainable society. We invite public intellectuals like Dr. Swaminathan across various spheres of life to come and speak at our platform. In the past, we have hosted, uh, among others, you know, Dr. Manjul Bhargava, Fields Medal winner, Dr. Joseph Stiglitz, the Nobel laureate, and many others. A bit about the program this evening. Soon after this introduction, uh, Dr. Soumya Swaminathan will deliver her talk for about 50 minutes. A brief introduction to the speaker, uh, Dr. Soumya Swaminathan's CV was part of the invitation, so I won't read it, but I'll just pick a couple of highlights. She's a rare combination of a doctor scientist, a pediatrician known for her research on tuberculosis and HIV, a global Indian who has done the country proud, having served as the chief scientist of the World Health Organization during the most challenging COVID years. She is a fellow of the National Academy of Sciences and the Indian Academy of Sciences and is now investing her energies in the MS Swaminathan Research Foundation. Dr. Swaminathan will deliver her talk on food and health. Are we on the right track? The topic itself, food and health, could have been called father and daughter, probably as aptly. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Swamya Swaminathan. Thank you so much, Professor Sudish, for that very kind introduction. Um, <clears throat> it's lovely to be back at uh, the BIC again. This is my third uh, talk uh, or visit here. The first one was for the first Girish Karnad Memorial Lecture. That was uh, right during the pandemic, actually, but we did have it in person. And, um, and then was a, a panel discussion on COVID and, you know, how did Karnataka respond? How did the country respond? What's going on now, etc. That was very interesting to get. Uh, we had uh, the Commissioner of Health, but we also had Dr. Prashant who works in the tribal areas and brought that perspective. So today, the topic is food and health, um, which has become now my uh, passion and interest after having been for a long time in biomedical research, looking at tuberculosis, infectious diseases, basically. I worked a lot on HIV, the interaction between TB and HIV, and noticed how nutrition was uh, so important, really, even though these are infectious diseases caused by bacteria or by virus, uh, the effect it has on the body and how uh, an individual responds, a lot of it is based on your nutrition, which in turn impacts, you know, your immunity. Um, and right from the beginning of my research career, I, you know, if you live in India, you can't help uh, encountering malnutrition in, in all its forms. Um, but as a pediatrician, I was most interested in young children, uh, and particularly children who live in tribal areas, as well as those who are in uh, urban, um, maybe low income environments which are not so good for either nutrition or for health. And then having been through the pandemic most recently as the chief scientist, as well as looking at the health data and statistics from around the world that you know, the WHO compiles, I was struck by the fact that our health is determined not so much by our access to a doctor or a health facility, which is what one thinks about. When you think about health care, you think about a doctor or a, or a health facility or, a, you know, getting some treatment. But our health is really determined 
by all of the things around us, what are called the social and environmental and economic and commercial determinants of health, or you can even talk about it as risk factors or determinants, and only 20% of your health outcomes are determined by access. Of course, access to health is very important, and so people who don't have access to health care or quality health care do suffer. But that's only when you fall sick. So most of our life is about preventing illness and sickness, or you can say promoting health. And therefore, mm, even when you think about our ministries of health and what they do, not just in India, but around the world, they should be called ministries of illness or ministries of disease, because they are focused on identifying and treating people who have fallen sick. They are not ministries of health. A ministry of health would be looking at how to keep people healthy. That's what public health should be about. Um, but we are far from, from there. So uh, yesterday I was talking to a group of lawyers. There's a conference called the Law Asia Conference that's happening here at the other end of town. These are lawyers from all over Asia and I was talking to them about climate change, public health and equity. And how climate change is really going to impact, is impacting all aspects of our life, how public health really needs to respond and um, how equity really plays a very important role. So the other thing I really got a very, very um, close look at during the pandemic was equity. Of course, here we're talking about equity between countries. We all saw the inequities in access right from masks, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, there were countries that had no access to protective equipment. They were making up things. People were putting on garbage bags and, you know, using whatever they had handy to protect themselves. Whereas other countries had, you know, full like space suits for their healthcare workers. Um, we saw, you know, inequities in access to oxygen, to a lot of health products. And then of course, when the vaccines were developed, which itself was a miracle to have vaccines developed in 11 months of the identification of a new virus, never been done before and it was only possible because there was a concerted and collaborative effort by the scientists around the world with a lot of funding, over $100 billion just put into development of vaccines alone, mainly by high income countries. Um, a lot of companies also investing, people stopped doing whatever they were doing and all scientists started working on COVID. So it is possible for science to find solutions actually to our uh, problems that face humanity today. It's not impossible at all. Uh, if you put the mind to it, if there is a resourcing and if there is the right kind of mission approach where scientists of all disciplines come together to try to solve one problem. The moon mission is, uh, is often cited as being an example uh, the first, you know, when Kennedy said that he was launching that, it was essentially a challenge for humanity, uh, you know, a technological challenge, which was overcome. And in the process, so much technology was created. That's what happened in the process of making vaccines. We now know about the mRNA, the power of mRNA technology, not only to make more vaccines, new vaccines, but also to uh, develop a host of other products. But what we did see, which was not the bright side of it, was the uh, the hoarding of vaccines by a few countries, the, the reluctance to share, um, and also the, the reluctance or the uh, refusal to share intellectual property and the technology knowledge, you know, which uh, some companies had access to. And... The worst part of it is that the companies that had access to that technology, let's take mRNA, for example, was all funded by taxpayer money. So it wasn't that the companies had invested. It was the NIH who had invested over a long period of time or other governments in academic labs, in universities, and created the technology which was then given away to the private sector to do what they like with it. So I think the whole model of R&D is also flawed. Now, I'm just... Digressing a bit from this uh, topic that I'll come to in a minute, just to give you a little bit of uh, background on uh, global health, public health, and uh, the issues of equity, particularly as they relate 
to uh, public goods, what we call as a, a global public good or a public good is something that's good for everyone that should be uh, equally available to everybody. So, for example, clean air or clean water or a vaccine that prevents disease, uh, these are public goods that everyone should have access to, right, uh, regardless of the ability to pay. And these are things also that government invests in, that public money is put into. And so it should never get uh, privatized, commercialized to the extent, to the point where some companies make a lot of money. So this is uh, not only relevant for vaccines for COVID, but it's relevant for everything. Now we want technologies to solve our climate problem, uh, global warming problem. We need affordable technologies that can help us both mitigate and adapt to global warming. But uh, again, we, if those technologies you know, are uh, in the hands of a few, um, then it becomes uh, challenging for low-income countries to move uh, fast enough, considering the fact that they, we will bear the brunt of uh, the impacts of climate change, even though we haven't contributed as much. Now, to get back to this topic, um, where we'll talk a little bit about nutrition and food and, you know, the, I think it's a rhetorical question, are we on the right track? But before I get into my talk, the idea was that we do a little bit of a audience quiz here. So could you all uh, take out your phones and, uh, and get this? Uh, this is the menti.com, this QR code. And if you can download menti, then what we'll do is we'll try and answer a few questions before we get started. So now we're going to go to the uh, uh, set of questions now. So do you think you have a healthy diet? Please click. Do you think you eat a healthy diet on your day to day? You can click yes or no. So about uh, very good. Two thirds of you think you have a healthy diet. <laughs> you should have had a maybe option. We'll go to the next one. How often do you waste food? Every day when I eat out, when there's vegetables on my plate, oh, if I don't have non-veg. These questions were designed by a young colleague of mine. So, one option less is coming. A lot of people waste food when we eat out. Every day also. People are wasting food every day. Okay, it's good that uh, people are honest here. Okay, how many of you look at food labels before you buy something or before you eat it? That's good. A lot of people are looking at food labels. Of course, in our restaurants and all, many times we don't get uh, labeling. But at least on this, in the supermarket, in the packets, you get labeling. But... Uh, Abroad now, you know, even in restaurants and even in the Starbucks, in fact, it's very horrifying if you go into Starbucks and you see how much your coffee, how many calories your coffee has, you know. I often then walk away saying, okay, I think I won't have this coffee if it's going to give me 350 or 400 calories. Okay, so a lot of people looking at food labels. And uh, what are the main things that you would look at in the food label? I think there should be some options there. Calories, fat, protein, sugar. Yeah. Brand. Okay. Great. Preservatives. Expiry date. Palm oil. Taste enhancers. Ingredients. Composition. Okay, excellent. But calories, fat and sugar. Clearly everybody is interested in that. But it's good that people are looking also at things like expiry date, at maida, at added chemicals, refined flour. I don't see trans fats but people are looking at fat percentage, refined sugar, etc. Okay. Now, this is more for us to have some uh, behavioral change options, like what kind of uh, campaigns do you think would affect you to change your food habits? You know, we've got so many celebrities selling so many products now on television. Is that really influencing you, you know, to buy that product? 
so these are limited uh, options i think but holdings apps so maybe later in the discussion we can talk about you know are there ways of uh, doing campaigns for healthier eating but youtube seems to be an an instagram i guess an app okay many people think an app on the phone might help not not so many think celebrities influencers so all those celebrities were getting paid quite a lot for ad- advertising things they should uh, be aware so here's something about causes of death in the sense what do the majority of people die of and uh, I, i don't know if you're all familiar with these terms non communicable diseases which are things like heart disease stroke dementia cancer cardiovascular disease heart attacks and infectious diseases okay but you know infectious diseases are still not so rare so malaria hiv tb kill a lot of people as you know covid killed a lot of people dengue is not so much a killer but yes it can also result but uh, i think you're getting the proportions right and as we get into an aging population then certainly non communicable diseases become much more common but unfortunately in countries like india we still have both and we have a rising burden of injuries and accidents road traffic injuries is huge last year we had more ro- uh, deaths due to road traffic injuries than the day year before 2020 was the only unusual year because of course of the lockdowns that a dramatic drop in road traffic fatalities but back again 21 22 and going up so as our road and infrastructure expands unfortunately we're not paying enough attention to safety so i think this uh, is quite a good maybe infectious diseases should be a little bit higher but these are the three major uh, causes of deaths okay so i think that was a quick um, we go back to the presentation now great thank you all very much for answering those questions and i think it's opened up some discussion points for us that we can talk about later so you're all aware of the sustainable development goals we're supposed to achieve them by 2030 now sdg 2 is zero hunger and if you look at the targets it has five targets uh, universal access to safe and nutritious food ending all forms of malnutrition double the productivity and income of small scale food producers uh, sustainable food production resilient agricultural practices very important and then maintaining the genetic diversity in food production so you know um, there are thousands and thousands of edible species i think some 8000 or so edible plant species that people have eaten from the beginning of time but if you look at what we eat today there are three species rice wheat and maize which make up about 70% of the cereals that are grown and eaten around the world so you know from thousands of species now we've come down to a handful that are grown in large volume so we are losing that um, diversity um, what is called agro biodiversity and genetic diversity and that's very bad for us because uh, if something happens to this these plants we have today they are such limited breeds then they can all be wiped out immediately so the genetic diversity in food actually helps them to also retain that vigor and the cross breeding that happens and also there are many uh, uh, of those land races which have a lot of uh, nutritional properties which rice wheat and maize don't have so those are the sub targets uh, of uh, sdg 2 and then there are three others 2a 2b and 2c which is investing in rural infrastructure agricultural research technology and gene banks and i don't know how many of you know about the svalbard gene bank which is in norway which was uh, my father had something to do with setting that up and it was done there because you know it's below the um, uh, it's in the arctic ice cap unfortunately now with arctic ice cap also melting that seed bank which was supposed to last forever and be in a place you know where seeds from around the world are preserved for posterity even that may be at risk so you have to go down into a cave you know which is deep under the uh, under the ice uh, so gene banks and seed banks are the only ways now today to preserve that diversity we have then prevent agricultural trade restrictions market distortions and export subsidies this is something that india keeps fighting for at the world trade organization and then ensuring stable food commodity markets and timely access to information now if you look at uh, you know we are halfway through the sdg so started in 2016 and supposed to end in 2030 so we're exactly at the midpoint the pandemic of course set back the world quite a bit 
And so if you look at India's performance, we are 112th out of 166 countries, so not doing that great. And then there's a, you can see on that uh, uh, wheel that you, you have some SDGs on which uh, we, we may be doing better, but a majority of them, you know, we're not doing that well. And in fact, there's been backsliding in some of them. If you look at the red arrows that are pointing down, you know, uh, reduced inequalities, that's number 10. That's actually, there's been backsliding, which means there's been increase in inequalities. And that's measured by something called the Gini Index. And then also life um, on the land, we're not doing well uh, on that. The, the only ones that we're doing uh, okay in is, you know, the, well, the climate action is, uh, is also not satisfactory. So in seven years, we have a lot of catch up and acceleration. So again, this is a very simple slide to say that when we talk about, if you hear the word malnutrition, it can mean both extremes. Undernutrition, which is underweight, uh, which is low weight for age, stunting, which is low height for age and wasting, as well as micronutrient deficiencies, which can occur with both under and over nutrition. And in over nutrition, you have, you know, categories like overweight uh, and then beyond uh, uh, 25 BMI, then it would be obesity and so on. So that's how, you know, you, the standard classification is. Now, of course, uh, both are harmful, but stunting in particular, which happens in early childhood. So, you know, the maximum growth of a baby, especially the brain development occurs in the first five years, but particularly in the first thousand days of life. The first thousand days starting from conception and the first two years of life. So that is a very critical period for both especially for brain and cognitive development, but also for physical development. So your height when you're two years of age determines your final height. And so anything you do after that will not have the kind of impact that you might want to see. So if you can start feeding up a baby or a child once they get into school, let's say they're very malnourished, that child will be permanently stunted because height is not going to improve. And in most countries of the world, as they develop, you see a secular increase in height. Every generation gets taller than the previous one. Uh, and even people with our genetic makeup, when they live in other countries, you can see that the children actually uh, come out much taller. But in our country, the, uh, there's no secular increase in height or it's insignificant. And we still have a very high proportion of stunting. Around 35% of children, according to the latest NFHS 5 data, are stunted. And it means not only that they are physically short, that maybe you can live with, but there's cognitive impairment, which means that you're really talking about the human capital of the next generation, which is being impacted because of malnutrition in the early years of life, pregnancy and the first two years. So the first thousand days and the first five years are very important. So again, we come back to this communicable, non-communicable, and we were talking about which is more common. So in blue, you see the what are called the non-communicable diseases and of course diabetes and uh, strokes and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD, ischemic heart disease, which is heart disease, heart attacks, all of that is causing a lot of uh, the deaths. And as we live longer, these are going to go up. But you'll also see in red, the infectious and uh, neonatal disorders are not necessarily all infectious, but uh, the early newborn um, and uh, Deaths which occur within the first 30 days of life, uh, maybe because of infection, could be because a baby is born very small and could be uh, also because of uh, uh, not having proper care during delivery and right after that. And then you have diarrheal diseases, lower respiratory infections uh, and tuberculosis still accounting for, even though we've reduced uh, diarrheal diseases a lot, but we still have, you can see the number of uh, mostly children, but also the very elderly who die of uh, pneumonias. Now, this was a trial, that uh, a study rather, that was done, funded by the ICMR, the Indian Council of Medical Research, was done over 15 years because large study where they, uh, all the states of India were actually sampled, I guess, except Jammu and Kashmir, which is blank, for the prevalence of non-communicable diseases. It was called the INDIAB study. So, mainly it was diabetes, but they did look at all these other things. So, what is, firstly, on this a chart here, you see the numbers in millions, 101 million people with diabetes, another 136 million with pre-diabetes, 
and if you look at hypertension 315 million so we are talking about 20 25% of the population and adult population is like a quarter of the adult population abdominal obesity so this is a peculiar form of obesity where there's more fat in the abdominal visceral region so that your waist circumference increases even though the rest of your body may be thin and this is very peculiar uh, for south asians where the fat accumulates in the abdomen so that is is huge also and then you have the hypercholesterolemia and things like that which is you know goes along with these other problems so all very very substantial and significant now if you look at the maps of india on the right the one on top actually shows you the prevalence of diabetes and as you can see the red will be the highest that is more than 10% so national average for diabetes was uh, and this was in people over the age of 15 was 11% so 11% was a national average but you can see the differences southern states considered to be more developed higher prevalence of diabetes highest in kerala tamil nadu goa punjab 30% you know 30% of people are diabetic then you find there are uh, as you go up north then maybe it's getting less uttar pradesh okay you might feel very happy that uttar pradesh has such a low prevalence of diabetes it's only less than 5% so they're doing something very good but if you look at this uh, at this uh, uh, below the map below this talks about something called pre diabetes that you have certain markers in your blood and your blood sugar is in a range and your hba1c is in a range which we call pre diabetes majority of these people are going to progress to diabetes it's a matter of time unless you take preventive action so if you can detect yourself when you have pre diabetes and you really put in some changes in your diet and your physical activity patterns and all you can probably prevent yourself from going into a diabetic state there are also some medicines which help but if you don't do that then over a period of the next 4 to 5 years you will become diabetic so the same states which we feel happy don't have so much diabetes if you look at the graph below the map below they are the same states which have a lot of people who are pre diabetic so it's not it's a question of time and i think it's related again to human development indicators we know that in the south you know income levels are more literacy rates are more you know housing sanitation all these things are better we've dealt with communicable diseases so kerala for example went into this epidemiological transition way back in the 1980s when nobody was even paying attention you know and therefore today we find ourselves in a situation where we have a huge burden and we haven't paid attention health ministries were not paying attention to that they were focusing on communicable diseases and maternal and child those were the big uh, focus areas during the mdg uh, era which was 2000 to 2015 and we made progress for sure in those areas but at the same time we had a blind spot so this is where we are today but we still have i think a window of opportunity at least in those states which are yellow and green in this uh, uh, in the pre diabetes uh, map or, or no if we take the pre diabetes map those states which are in red which are still in yellow or green on top we could intervene now and and make a difference so that we don't have the same situation happening there now if you talk about risk factors for uh, death we talked about mortality right and uh, this is one way actually of uh, um, it's not to be morbid but it's a way of understanding your burden of disease you know when you understand what people are dying of in a particular area and this is why the figures even during the pandemic were so important to have accurate reporting of death whether it's due to covid or due to something else what is the excess mortality that was happening during that time so these are the risk factors and if you look at risk factors right on top you'll find of course men and women slightly different but dietary risks are right up there right so second and third in terms of the risk factors so our diet is what is actually determining our our reason for dying could be through a variety of pathways then high systolic blood pressure i showed you that we have about a quarter of our adults in india for example with hypertension it's true for many other countries and because it's asymptomatic you don't have any symptoms of high blood pressure unless you're testing yourself you will never know till you'll end up with a complication you know so it's not true that everybody with high blood pressure gets headaches and you might end up many years later finding that you have kidney problems or kidney failure and then you find out it was all because of uncontrolled high bp so unless people test they won't know then 
I want you to notice also air pollution which is up there at number 4. So even though you know 95% of us are living in cities or places in the world which do not meet the WHO standards for air quality and India is particularly uh, bad for, for air quality, air pollution, uh, both because of household, we still have indoor air pollution. You know, a lot of women in rural India in particular still using biomass. Uh, even though they may have an LPG cylinder in the house, if you actually see what they do, they use the LPG cylinder very sparingly because it's expensive and they still use wood or other biomass for like heating water or things like that. So it's still being exposed to indoor air pollution. Plus we of course all see what the outdoor air pollution levels are like, but it's a huge risk factor for our health. And it's something that everybody is exposed to and it's you can't really escape from it. Then, you know, you see the other risk factors like, okay, high body mass index. So if you're overweight, high cholesterol, alcohol, malnutrition, then there are occupational risks. Um, unsafe sex, particularly for women, low physical activity and other environmental and occupational risks. And again, occupational health is something that we don't uh, pay a lot of attention to. But whether it's a software setting, whether you know, you're sitting at your computer all day or whether you're working in a hazardous factory or whether you're a miner who's working with uh, and exposed to silica dust or whether you're a fisherwoman who is constantly having to peel prawns and, you know, have your fingers or a salt pan worker who is exposed to the hot sun and salt all the time. Every occupation has its own uh, risks and I think that's not something that's very well understood or uh, uh, we, we don't take the necessary precautions. Now again, how do we make this link? We said we looked at the top risk factors, we looked at the top causes of death, the link between non-communicable diseases and diet. So the top risk factors here are a diet low in whole grains and a diet which is high in sodium. So probably the number one will be sodium, too much salt. And we're supposed to take five grams or less of salt in a day. And the average, I think in India is about eight to nine grams. And in, quite often it's more than that. And the more processed and ultra processed food you eat, the more salt, hidden salt there will be. And also a lot of hidden sugar. So... And low in whole grains, so that means what? We're eating polished wheat, you know, polished uh, rice, maida and things like that. Anything which is white in color, they say is bad for health. A diet low in fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds, low in fiber, low in omega-3 fatty acids, low in legumes, high in trans fats. So many countries have now banned trans fats. In India, I think we have an upper limit of 2% or something. Trans fats get formed when... You reuse the oil for cooking. So a lot of people, you know, you fry and then again next day you're using the same oil. Uh, that uh, generates a lot of trans fats. So that's very, very bad for the health. Diet high in sugar-sweetened beverages, low in calcium, low in milk or high in red meat, etc. So these are uh, the major links. But you can just, you know, the top three or four are what is going to be important. And recently the World Bank looked at you know, affordability of a healthy diet because it's all very well to tell people you got to eat so much of fruits and vegetables, etc. But if you do look at that analysis, then the majority of Indians cannot afford a healthy diet. And I think this has been also studied by local uh, groups and universities that the average person cannot afford to eat what is uh, referred uh, a healthy diet, which, you know, you have the definition on the right side. So it must achieve all the nutrient adequacy and uh, have sufficient diversity. So even though there is a relationship here between the cost and the GDP per capita, but if you look at the graph on the right-hand side, it is uh, there is a correlation between people who cannot afford a healthy diet and the GDP per capita. So overall, we have this multiple um, challenges or um, triple burden, you could call it. On the one hand, you have undernutrition in children, like we said, wasting, stunting, etc., there are figures there. You have undernutrition in women. It's going down. So NFHS 5 showed women 18%, men 16%, BMI less than 18.5 compared to a little bit higher in NFHS 4. But again, this will have a wide variability between states. If you go to Jharkhand, Chhattisgarh, tribal regions of our country, you'll find 40 to 50% of women 
will have a BMI below 18.5. And similarly, uh, uh, and very worryingly, the overweight and, overweight and obese is going up, uh, particularly among women and particularly in urban areas. And uh, so almost the same here, women and men, 25% almost uh, have already become overweight or obese. Anemia has been a problem that we haven't been able to crack, whether it's children or women, slightly less in men, um, and particularly pregnant women, despite all of the programs we've had. So there's something going wrong there. And probably what it is, it's the lack of dietary diversity. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that because majority of Indians, you know, the diet is mostly cereal based. Of course, water sanitation are very important. It's not just enough to be able to eat a healthy food, but whether it gets absorbed is depends on whether you have a lot of infections in your gut. And that in turn is basically safe water and sanitation. So as that improves, uh, certainly the absorbability of the food that we eat, you know, uh, keeps improving and, and also there are less worms, intestinal worms, there's now deworming program and all that. Now, if you look at the NFHS data and look at gaps, and again, talking really about starting with birth, you know that breast milk is very essential for uh, the normal growth. In fact, a baby shouldn't get anything except breast milk for six months. Um, but again, the NFHS tracks that. And 40% uh, of children started breastfeeding within an hour of birth. That's the standard. 64% under six months are exclusively breastfed, it's supposed to be 100%. But more worrying than that is the complementary foods. After six months, a baby needs more than breast milk, needs many more calories and other um, uh, nutrients. Now, adequacy of the complementary feeds, that means quantity and quality, is only 11%. So only 11% of babies in India who are seven months and above older are actually getting the right quantity and quality of food. So no wonder that we see a lot of uh, growth falling off the growth charts at that starting at seven, eight months, nine months, and then continuing. And that's when the stunting begins. As long as babies breastfed, they usually grow well. Lack of creches affects both physical and cognitive growth. So many working women have no choice but to leave their babies either with an older sibling or with a uh, their uh, some relative or a grandmother or something and uh, I've seen quite often that these babies are not fed you know as they should be fed because babies need to be fed every you know few hours but if it's a sibling or somebody else looking after they'll just give the child something and that child is chewing on something which is not even getting any nutrition you know just to keep them quiet so I think that the six months to three years period is when we are really missing the bus and uh, uh, just one intervention alone crash which can provide both nutrition and cognitive stimulation, I think will make a big impact. But unfortunately, both in rural areas and in urban areas, we don't have that facility. The Anganwadis only cater to children above three. And what they do is they give the mother take-home rations to cook and feed those younger babies. But if the in rural India, women are not sitting at home. Or even in urban, most low-income women have to go to work. And so this becomes a very huge uh, issue. Similarly, school children, um, under six, of course, they are getting some supplementary foods from the ICDS program and then they're getting a midday meal. But again, the quantity and quality of the midday meal uh, in many states, it would be mainly, again, cereal based, may not have adequate uh, amount of protein or, uh, you know, fruits and vegetables. And similarly, women do get something called, again, the take home ration and nutrition education, but this all needs a redesign. So I think we have to think about our food system as a whole. And food systems, if you look at the drivers, starting with climate change, which is really going to have a big impact. We saw last year that for the first time in many years, the wheat output reduced. Wheat yields came down because unseasonal heat in the, in the month of March. Globalization and trade and trade, you know, uh, sort of restrictions between countries and all of that plays a role. What you can export, what you can import and so on. The income growth and distribution has a big impact on food environments, urbanization, population growth, migration. So at least if you have a rural, uh, if you're living in a rural area, you have a small piece of land, it's possible that you may be able to grow something in the backyard. But in the urban areas, even that is not possible if you're living in a slum or in a, in a housing board. Of course, the uh, politics and leadership is important, but also consumer behavior. So we have to look right from the beginning and see what we're growing 
what our supply chains are like, what are the food environments like, the economic aspects, uh, and then uh, the social, economic, and environment and env environment that we live in. I already mentioned that high sodium is uh, probably the one dietary risk with the largest impact on health, and then low consumption of whole grains, fruits, and vegetables. And so, this uh, study that was done by the IHME found that just increasing vegetable consumption from zero to 350 grams per day. Um, again, they do a lot of it is by modeling, but it was a, it could be associated with a significant decline in in all of these uh, things. And in fact. In other countries which have implemented certain policies, they can show, like for example, uh, in the UK, they implemented a policy of, uh, of banning trans fats, but also of reducing um, salt, you know, the bread and all that um, through a policy and a regulatory mechanism. And they did find that there were, it matched up with the reduction in the number of people who were getting admitted with heart attacks. Similar declines can be seen actually for air pollution interventions as well. So, if, But on the other hand, you look at which grains uh, are being produced, you'll find that it's um, rice and wheat uh, again. Uh, uh, and whereas if you look at pulse, uh, millets, which are also called nutri-cereals or Sri Anna now in India, and pulses, they are more or less stagnating. In fact, area under uh, millet coverage has come down, even though the production uh, is uh, is the same is stagnating so again if you don't have the right incentives in place for farmers you can't expect them to switch from a crop that's giving them a assured income just because we say it's healthier it's better for the environment it's better for them it's economics and so they, the farmer needs the right incentive as well as a disincentive if you want them to switch so i i think that what is called nutrition sensitive agriculture, but I would even call it agriculture for health. Uh, are we really thinking about was agri are farmers and the ministries which govern them, the policies really thinking about, uh, you know, how do we diversify our agricultural system? They, it has to be location specific. Everybody now agrees that growing paddy in Punjab is not the right thing to do, and yet, you know, that con continues. Technology enable learning. I think it's really uh, now today. Uh, farmers can get the right information at the right time using digital technologies and uh, we need to really uh, expand that. Soil health, we've lost a lot of soil health you know, over a period of time. So there's very little uh, nutrition in the soil. So naturally the crops are not going to have those micronutrients if the soil doesn't have. So again, we need to move away from chemicals more to bio inputs, bio fertilizers. And then for fruits and vegetables, it's important to address the issues along the value chain because very often you hear stories of farmers having to throw away or waste uh, or there's a glut of tomatoes or a glut of something and then they don't get the price uh, and they've taken all the trouble to grow it because we don't have the storage facility, we don't have the food processing capacity. And I think promoting the local use of seasonal vegetables and fruits. This is something that all of us can do. Uh, rather than buying things which have traveled thousands of miles, you know, by airplane. Um, at least when I go to the market, I try and see if not locally what is uh, grown in India, especially fruits. And I prefer to buy that rather than the imported fruits. But also seasonal, you know, nowadays we have got used to because of our supermarkets. Uh, earlier we all, uh, at least I remember, many of you are very young, but uh, it used to be seasonal, you know, so and we would look forward to those seasons and you didn't expect to get those things in the other times of the year. So there was an anticipation also of when certain fruits and vegetables would be available. And there was a change in the summer vegetables, you would move into the winter vegetables, especially in the north. But today we expect everything everywhere all at once. And so that's also a problem. Um, it's not good for the environment. Millets are rich in protein, rich in um, minerals, dietary fiber, and a uh, lot of phenolic compounds. But again, we have to remember that many of all these nutrients are in the outer layer. And so if you dehusk and debran it and make it white, then it's you might as well be eating white rice. And um, uh, in fact, there was a study done by Dr. Mohan's Diabetes Center in Chennai, where they went out and collected 100, uh, 100 packets of millet uh, products from different stores in Chennai. And when they tested it, they found that uh, over 80% of them actually had uh, uh, polished it to the point where it lost all the 
advantages of eating so even though you may think you're buying a millet and eating a millet product actually if you look at the nutrition in it you might as well be eating rice so i think it's really important going back to the looking at the composition and the packages uh, information and also to ask questions about how these millets are being processed and uh, one I- point issue is again and i've got to know this recently by traveling to tribal areas in orissa that these millets need special machinery for uh, for milling you can't just take it to the rice flour and have it done there so what happens is in the past women were doing it by hand the pounding <clears throat> and that's a lot of drudgery so to make half a kg or 1 kg of millets for the household the woman had to spend an hour pounding it um they've given that up because it's much easier you get your pds rice and you know you can do away with one hour of drudgery so again there are reasons again related to gender related to women's work and time why millet consumption has gone down and so today while some of us in the urban areas have the privilege of buying millets and eating them actually if you go to the tribal areas where millets are grown they are not eating them for this reason that they cannot spend that time in processing it and just putting simply in these millet uh, you know machines uh, milling machines which we've done through some self help groups and all in uh, koraput district and also in namakal district of tamil nadu makes a big difference and those women can not only then consume but also they sell and they make money so helping them to add value to the uh, to their uh, agricultural produce and again different millets have different uh, uh, they all have of course uh, majority of uh, the content is uh, carbohydrate it's not like millets don't have carbohydrate but they have more calcium more iron and again each millet is different and uh, jawar bajra and uh, ragi are the three uh, main ones um, but there huge variety of millets in india which are again being forgotten so there's a whole area of work around neglected and underutilized and forgotten foods which include these small millets which our grandmothers uh, remember using but we certainly don't as well as lots of uh, forest produce and all which again the indigenous people have a lot of knowledge about but we don't know like if i walk through a forest i don't know which leaves i can eat and which you can't but if you going with a tribal person they'll tell you let's pluck these and then you know we can use it for the next meal so that knowledge is also dying out and we are getting narrower and narrower in what we eat so we've also got this uh, you know there are many people who do these nutrition gardens now so again that's something mssrf has done uh, in terms of the co- at the community level at the household level but you can also do it in anganwadi and school campuses the advantage of doing that is children also learn a little bit about gardening and about what plants uh, give what kind of uh, benefits and uh, we've in fact put up these gardens in some places like under the flyover in taramani where the corporation has a big playground we've created a nutrition garden there uh, and there's labeling so that people when they walk around can see which plants are giving them what micronutrients similarly in crestes anganwadi center school meals we talked about how we need to improve uh, uh, the the nutritional content and it can be done actually fairly easily by connecting with local farmers local self help groups etc but that's easier said than done then there are many models of a uh, uh, healthy meals at an affordable cost um, there's annapurna food van there's the amma unavagam in uh, in tamil nadu of course i won't say it's perfectly healthy because it's quite uh, rich in uh, in uh, high in rice and cereal but this uh, bottom one is quite interesting it, it's a mobile teaching kitchen um, that was uh, done with a project you know by this group at oxford called the global institute for food nutrition and health what they did is they took you know women who are actually sex workers and then they taught them how to cook nutritiously of course using their own local recipes and so on this is in calcutta and then these women started going with these mobile vans and selling these uh, thalis affordable but at the same time while you stand there and you're eating your food they're also talking to you about nutrition so they also become nutrition educators so i think that to me my mind is a is a wonderful model where you're creating a livelihood opportunity but they're also spreading um, nutrition awareness again uh, you know this my plate for the day from the national institute of nutrition it tells you what your plate should look like um, and your total fat should be less than 30% and should totally avoid saturated and trans fats ideally sugar should be less than 5% of total energy intake salt under 5 grams and consume 400 grams of 
fruits and vegetables a day. Again, this comes from the US. Again, it talks about uh, what you should have on your plate, but it also says drink water because, you know, there everybody drinks a, a sugar sweetened beverage with their meal. Then physical activity is also, you know, very important. We forget. And uh, those of us who live in cities, it is quite difficult. And I noticed that I was walking so much more when I lived in Geneva. It was very, very pleasant and easy to walk or cycle over there. Uh, just doing your day-to-day, -day, you know, you get enough uh, steps in walking to work and back. Here, you know, in our cities, even if you want to, it is very difficult to walk. Now, physical activity has all of these benefits that are listed there. It's not just about your weight, uh, but it is about mental health and cognitive function and uh, increasing cardiorespiratory fitness. And as you get older, it's really important to continue to exercise and, uh, and uh, in order to retain your, your strength in your bones as well as some muscle tone. Most uh, uh, dangerous thing as you get older is to have a fall and, and, and fracture and therefore some people who've continued to exercise are at much lower risk. So at, at the WHO recommends that you know adults should do at least 150 to 300 minutes of moderate intensity physical activity per week. So that means you know 30 to 40 minutes a day. Then the other a big aspect is food waste. We all don't even realize that one third of the food produced in India gets wasted or spoiled before it is even eaten. And the part of food that is lost from harvest up to the retail level is called food loss. And that's what we talked about, you know, farmers having to throw away things because they don't have storage. Or uh, we see sometimes pictures of the FCI go down where there are rats that are eating or they're being exposed to the rain, etc. and getting uh, lost. But then there's also from the consumer retail onwards, which is the waste that we all uh, talked about, you know, whether we waste food or not. So again, how can you avoid food waste? Plan your meals, make a shopping list. And then also adopt a more sustainable, healthier diet with local produce, etc. And then look at food labeling so that you don't buy something and then have to waste it. Food safety is another important one, particularly since we have a lot of street food uh, in India. It's a huge problem globally. One in 10 people fall ill after eating contaminated food. A lot of lives are lost with uh, you know, foodborne illnesses and especially children, young children. And very often it's from the uh, water. Uh, that contaminates you know the food but nowadays of course we also have uh, the issue of pesticide residues on food so you need to wash it very well so again if you don't have access to water then it's a challenge it's easy for us to say you know do this and that but it all depends on the environment you live in there are uh, you know policy and regulatory uh, changes one can make so in schools for example definitely both a curriculum on diet and nutrition and as well as the meal itself that is served in the schools actually can make a big difference. And I think children, school children is where we have to start because habits are formed there. A recent uh, study we did in Tamil Nadu showed that adolescent girls between the age of 12, 11 and 15 actually had the worst eating habits. And they were the ones who were eating the most of this, um, you know, chips and uh, absolute junk food. Um, so, that is going to impact their health. You know, they are the future mothers and all that. So if they are not healthy, then uh, it's going to be bad for the future. So I think we have reached a sort of point where this has become a very big problem today. And it's uh, many of these foods are also addictive because these food companies do a lot of research into the exact uh, ingredients which get you hooked. This is why when you open a packet of chips, you cannot stop, right, till you finish eating the last one. Uh, they know exactly the combination of sugar and salt and we know through science, you know, that it releases certain chemicals in the brain, uh, dopamine, that uh, gives you feeling of, uh, of high, it gives you feeling of happiness and, and so that's what you're fighting against, right? So you're telling people to eat a carrot or an apple or a banana, maybe you're not getting that same feeling that you're getting from your packet of chips or a chocolate. And there are lots of very uh, tempting chocolates uh, outside <laughs> today. So it's uh, ironical, actually, that this talk is <laughs> going on uh, while those people are selling. No, but even chocolates can be healthy if you have the high, uh, the dark chocolates, which have less sugar and are mostly uh, cocoa. 
then packaged foods you know we can actually fssai can do a lot more to uh, regulate and to also prevent advertising so you find a lot of processed foods advertised as being good for this that and the other including immunity build your muscle this and that but you look at composition it's sugar how do you build muscles with sugar how do you build immunity with sugar actually they should not be allowed to advertise uh, those kind of claims which are completely untrue uh, regulation of use of additives then when you eat out again try to eat healthy and taxing junk food so in thailand there's a very good uh, institute called the institute for health promotion which is something i think every country should have but very few do and essentially it goes back to what we were saying earlier that to promote health you need a different set of activities than to treat people who are sick so what that institute does and it's funded entirely by taxes on tobacco on alcohol and on uh, high sugar uh, foods sugar sweetened beverages those are taxed more heavily so that it's also a disincentive for people to buy them and then they that tax comes into this institute which works on policies to promote health whether it's about road safety or it's about uh, tobacco use and uh, or about healthy eating or physical exercise you know in thailand they there's a huge amount of sugar and salt in their diet which i realized because all of their even their salads have a, a lot of salt and sugar and southeast asia uses the fish uh, fish uh, sauce which is very high in salt so again it's cultural and so changing that means that you know you've got to educate the public based on local so so there are examples uh, globally of uh, of doing well similarly food labeling so this front of pack food labeling if you have a traffic light system where you could have a, a red if you saw a red on the packet then you would look twice right to see what it is and and then you would make a choice should i buy this or not um but again the companies are all you know don't want this obviously so there's a big lobby that fights against this type of uh, labeling in singapore for example what they did is they had abcd so your package is uh, according to the composition of sugar so they just started with sugar alone because i think that's sugar and salt actually are both very harmful so they started with sugar if you are c or d that means that you have too much sugar in in the product and you can't advertise your product so the company cannot advertise that product and when the consumer sees it in the shop they see c or d and they think okay why don't i look for something which has an a or a b label in 2 years they have found that companies have reduced the amount of sugar in their products because nobody wants to be in that c and d category so voluntarily they've cut down so there are ways actually of pushing companies also to to behave better then of course we have the huge public distribution system 800 million people are getting um, their food from the pds so if we could repurpose that and not just fill people's bellies or talk about food security but rather talk about nutrition security that means you're going to give them you have to provide more nutritious uh, things for them not just rice and wheat uh, today which is practically free but millets pulses you know more protein uh, healthier oils and sort of palm oil we should be giving healthier oils maybe reduce the amount of sugar that we give don't provide maida but you know give more uh, healthier options more proteins of course fortified foods now uh, the government is fortifying cereals but again that's artificial fortification which is being done by addition of the iron and some micronutrients and ideally you know that kind of chemical fortification of course if you have to do it for a limited period of time you could do it because the whole country you know is, they feel is anemic and so this is the only way out but eventually that's not the way to correct nutritional deficiencies it has to be through your diet that you you get a balanced uh, uh, diet uh, similarly could we think about distribution of vegetables fruits and pulses at subsidized prices if you know doesn't all have to be free you have in many places these sundays or farmers markets you know where farmers can come and sell their produce of course monitoring of food loss and waste and proper storage facilities can really help to reduce the waste because as i said we are wasting one third of what we are actually producing which is huge huge amount so all of that we could uh, but it needs a little more investment this is not going to happen uh, uh, for no additional expenditure because as you eat healthier we saw that it costs more and so 
there would have to be a deliberate effort uh, to do that so we can talk about behavior change communication uh, how do we actually get these messages across to people there's uh, people trying different things uh, there's um, a person i know who's uh, developed a game a video game on on nutrition that he's uh, implementing in schools to see whether games can actually make people change Ch children this is 6 to 8 standard children um right to food is a human right and we do have in india a, a right to food act um but the elements there are availability adequacy and accessibility so we still don't have all those uh, elements that work for everybody so i think as i conclude maybe one thing before i conclude is to talk about um, nutrition and uh, infectious diseases because i haven't covered that in my talk and we shouldn't think that our nutrition is only related to these uh, diabetes and heart disease and things like that so i've as i mentioned worked on tb and hiv um and in our research we did find long ago that if you gave people uh good nutrition so enough calories protein micronutrients then you could actually improve their outcomes whether it was hiv or tb and so for tb it's a well accepted fact that uh, people who are malnourished and get tb they have a higher risk of both death and also doing very badly with their tb they may not uh, get well for a long time so if you can supplement them so the government also has a program where they give 500 rupees to every tb patient supposed to be to for their own nutrition it's called the nikshay portion um, program uh, and more recently they started the government announced another program where they ask uh, the public anyone who's interested to sponsor a tb patient for 6 months that is called uh, pradhan mantri nikshay mitra i think so you become a friend of uh, the tb patient and you give them Uh, a basket of uh, good nutritious food for six months. You pay for it basically through your local TB program. So again, it's a voluntary thing, and uh, I found that in remote areas of the country, though patients won't get it because there's no one there to support, or there's no mechanism to support that. But uh, what was interesting is a trial that was recently done in Jharkhand, and this was published in the Lancet, and it was started when I was still in the ICMR. where by supplementing the household uh, of a tb patient so tb patient of course by you know gets uh, additional nutrition but this study looked at what happens to the family and the families of tb patients are at higher risk of getting tb the household contacts so if you give every individual adult and child additional calories and protein and this was jharkhand mind you in tribal jharkhand where malnutrition is rampant the incidence of tb in that in those households was reduced by 50% compared to the control group which did not get that right so it was a randomized controlled trial and for the first time in the world showed that uh nutrition could uh, prevent tb now there's enough data on the other side which is that by analyzing risk factors for tb everybody puts under nutrition as number one risk factor for tb so that was well known and hiv diabetes tobacco and alcohol these are the top 5 risk factors for tb and in india it's more under nutrition than hiv if you go to africa it's more hiv than under nutrition but nobody had done a trial that if you make somebody uh, get better nutrition can you prevent tb so this trial in jharkhand showed that now of course we don't have a good vaccine for tb bcg vaccine is a 100 year old vaccine given to babies newborns and it protects them for the first few years of life it certainly doesn't protect as as adults but here's something which is uh, maybe you could say food as a vaccine which is actually preventing you from getting uh, tb obviously by boosting immunity i mean we still need to do the studies to show what are the pathways by which it is acting the other thing i haven't spoken about is microbiome and how our food influences the microbiome which is all the bacteria and that live uh, and the and the other bugs that live within us and you know we have Uh, i don't know how many billions uh, vijay will probably know 2 billion microbes in our gut so we have more microorganisms in our body than human cells even and so uh, those um, can be influenced by diet and therefore there's a whole range of science and research around uh, whether you can change the microbiome i think ayurveda probably had those those principles because you know they 
classify you uh, for a certain type of uh, metabolism and then they, they prescribe a certain kind of diet which suits your metabolism. In scientific terms today, we would say that you are trying to change the microbiome. There are even studies you know, with fecal transplants. So they've taken uh, fecal transplants uh, and put them, because you're trying to get, get the good bacteria from one person who's healthy to another person. This has been tried for treatment of obesity as well. Uh, a lot of the work is still done in mice, some human trials, but there were safety issues as well with the fecal uh, transplant trials because you can, you don't want the person to end up with a very bad infection. So I think that part is probably going a bit slow, but a lot of work on neurocognitive uh, uh, changes and uh, their relationship with the microbiome and what you eat influences how you feel, uh, etc. So, you know, there's, uh, there's a lot of deep science uh, there as well that uh, needs much more research. So I think for all the young people in the audience who are interested in this, there's a lot that's still not known about how nutrition is impacting our health and how we could actually change um, you know, even our mental well-being, let alone physical well-being, by changing uh, our diet. And sometimes it's trial and error. And of course, some people are allergic to certain things or some people are intolerant, like gluten intolerance, for example. But those are extreme forms. But um, otherwise, you know, sometimes people say, oh, I feel very different, you know, after I've changed my diet, uh, after I've moved from one type of food to another type of food, etc. So there is a lot of science there, which is uh, still being uh, uh, worked on. But I think the message I wanted to say is that really um, diet is the most important determinant of our health uh, throughout our life course. Early on in life, of course, it's very important because it affects the baby, how it grows and how well the brain grows, etc. But it's important also at the other extreme of life, old age as well, when we are paying less attention. As you know, older people eat less. They, they are not able to eat as much. But it's really important that they get the right nutrients and don't become deficient. So I think that whole area is also something that we need to be paying much more attention to. Um, elderly care is going to become uh, more and more, I think, of a priority for us. So this is just to summarize, you know, what we've just uh, talked about, dietary risks being the leading cause of disabilities and ill health. It does require multi-sectoral action, as we've just seen. Uh, nutrition is something that is everywhere and is nowhere in terms of programming. And so if you look, you know, our ministries are all quite siloed and each one has a certain program of work. Nutrition sits uh, officially within the women and child department, not in health. So that means they're focusing on women and children. But actually, this is something that affects everybody. It shouldn't only be for pregnant women and young children that we talk about nutrition. So I think that is why we have to take that discourse much higher. It does ideally, like climate change, it should be something that is uh, coordinated at a higher level. I think we do need a fundamental shift in our agricultural priorities and incentives uh, in our PDS and how we distribute what we distribute as free food or school meals or anganwadi meals, creches I mentioned for the first thousand days of life, addressing women's needs, which have be really been neglected for a long time. We need to put equity into all our planning. So we're targeting the most vulnerable and also do it in a context specific way. Community participation, monitoring and delivery always improves any program. So that community feedback uh, Digital tools for monitoring now are being more widely used. Uh, but I must say that these cannot actually replace what human beings can do. And so you can use digital tools to supplement or to complement, to support what our uh, Anganwadi workers and our ASHAs and ANMs are doing. AI also can help, you know, uh, in many ways. But I think it's using AI intelligently that is, uh, that's going to be key. Commercial determinants of health are probably the biggest challenge, if you ask me today, because the kind of advertising and the money that these big companies are spending uh, really are, are the ones that are uh, influencing the food choices. So we need a massive behavior change campaign, uh, well, targeting youth, but really targeting everybody. 
And I'm not sure exactly what is going to work. And this is why it was a question early on that, uh, that I had posed, but it would be good to have some discussion around that. And I think that's my last slide. So I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much for your attention and uh, 